CSIS Korea Chair and the Global Peace Foundation. We want to welcome you all uh, to another in our series of discussions on Korea, Korean unification. Uh, my name is Victor Cha. I'm the Senior Advisor and Korea Chair here at CSIS as well as um, a professor at Georgetown University. Uh, and I think we have a really interesting uh, discussion today about uh, the role of Russia uh, when we look at uh, the Korean Peninsula, both in terms of issues of economics and investment, as well as looking into the future uh, with regard to unification. I'll introduce our featured speaker in a moment, um, Dr. Zebin. Uh, but before I do, I want to give an opportunity to uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Mike Marshall, from the Gold Peace Foundations to say a few words of introduction. So Mike. Thank you, Victor. Um, good morning. I'd like to welcome you all here on behalf of the uh, Global Peace Foundation, which is the co-sponsor of this forum series. Uh, thank you, sorry, and thank you all for, for, for coming. Um, I'd also like to thank Victor, uh, Ellen Kim, and, and, and all of his team um, for working to put together this series of forums. This is the fourth of five. Uh, we have one more coming up next month, looking at Japan's role in, in the region. Uh, and in relation to the, to the peninsula. The, the purpose of these forums is really to try and take a fresh look at certain aspects of Korean unification and also at Korea's changing place in the world uh, which affects uh, issues related to unification. Um, the Global Peace Foundation that I represent uh, is an international nonprofit organization that's committed to exploring and promoting innovative values-based approaches to peace building and development. We're active in the US, Korea, and 14 other countries across Asia, Africa, and Latin America, promoting initiatives for community development and national transformation. Uh, we have a particularly active uh, chapter in Korea, uh, and their major focus over the past couple of years and through this year uh, is the issue of, of Korean unification. Um, we are very interested in creating uh, new approaches, looking at uh, new possibilities in thinking about the Korean unification issue. Uh, that involves three main areas. Uh, one area is uh, a, a very strong effort to reach out to engage the Korean public, particularly younger people, in the issue of unification and getting them to think about it. Uh, as many of you know who track this, uh, there's a lot of um, indifference and apathy towards the issue, especially among, among young Koreans. Uh, we're, we're seeking to change that. Uh, related to that, um, we're promoting programs to get Koreans to think more about uh, the history, culture of their country, going way back beyond 1945 when the division happened, um, and really starting to consider what Korean identity is uh, and looking at that as a basis for uh, some type of connection with, with the people of the North, that beyond the ideological divisions, uh, there's a long shared cultural history. Uh, and uh, then also, we're looking to engage civil society groups uh, across South Korea. Um, we're engaged with a coalition organization for Action for Korea United. Uh, that is engaging NGOs and civil society groups uh, in the unification issue. Uh, and finally, uh, geopolitically, we're trying to put an emphasis on thinking of the future, not just of the peninsula, but the Northeast Asia region. Uh, because the, the, the division of the peninsula and the possible unification in the future will affect the relations of all the surrounding countries, those involved in the six-party talks uh, and others. Uh, so in that context, I think it's very timely that we've been looking at the role of the different surrounding countries, and today we'll look at the, uh, the, the, the role and the interests of Russia uh, in Northeast Asia as a whole and in the future of the peninsula. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Michael. And um, it, yeah, it has been a... Um, quite a good series that we've been working with uh, GPF on um, this year on different aspects of Korea and Korean unification. <clears throat> and um, uh, 
Um, and today, it's our, um, really our distinct pleasure to welcome Dr. Alexander Zevin, um, who, um, as many of you know, is director uh, of the Center for Korean Studies of the Institute of Far Eastern Studies, uh, the Russian Academy of Sciences uh, in Moscow. Um, he, uh, he has spent uh, 12 years in North Korea as a journalist and a diplomat, <clears throat> and there are not many people in Washington who could claim that, I think. <laughs> uh, um, so I think we have a very unique perspective with us uh, today. He joined uh, uh, IFAS in 1992, and since then participated in various international seminars on Korean affairs at home and abroad. Any of you who do any work on Korea um, internationally will know his name well and will have seen him at various uh, conferences and events around the world. Uh, Dr. Zevin has been the director of CKS since 2004. Uh, his fields of research include political developments in North Korea, Russia-North Korea relations, uh, the security situation surrounding the Korean Peninsula, uh, the nuclear problem, um, um, as well as uh, Russia-South Korea relations. He's the author of three books. Um, uh, many, many book chapters and many articles on Korean affairs in academic journals, in policy journals, as well as um, in influential newspapers and media. Uh, he's a graduate of the Moscow State Institute of International Relations uh, of the uh, Soviet Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He also received his PhD from IFAS uh, in 1998. So let me just emphasize again, it's really a pleasure to have you with us here today. Uh, Dr. Zevin will open with um, some opening remarks, and then we have a, a panel of experts that will all join on the stage, and we'll have a discussion about his remarks as well as the issues more broadly. So uh, on behalf of CSIS and GPF, uh, welcome Dr. Zevin to CSIS. First of all, I would like to thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to, for inviting me to the Center of uh, Strategic International Studies. Uh, and uh, my presentation will be mostly centered on Russia, policy towards North Korea, and of course, unification of Korea issues. Since you have my paper already uh, at the entrance, <laughs> everybody have it. I try to uh, make uh, some summary presentation that was well written and to add uh, a little bit what was not written in the paper. History says uh, that uh, any serious aggravation of situation, the most so armed conflicts on the Korean Peninsula, always jeopardize Russia's security, compelled her to undertake additional measures to defend her national interests in the region. Several times Russia had to use her armed forces in Korea to protect her national interests against non-continental adversaries, as it happened in 1904, 05, 1945, and uh, on a very limited scale in 1950, 53. That's why Russia pays much attention to efforts aimed at maintaining peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula, developing constructive relations with both Korean states and promoting dialogue between North and South Korea. Moscow hopes that inter-Korean dialogue and cooperation, firstly, will remove the threat of military conflict right next to the Russian Far Eastern borders, and secondly, promote economic ties with two Korean states, as well as will help implementation of multilateral economic projects with Russia participation in Northeast Asia. Absence of normal relations between North and South Korea obviously hinder realization of such projects as linking Russian Trans-Siberian main lane with Trans-Korean railways, construction of gas pipeline and electricity line from, Korea, from Russia via North Korean territory to South Korea. 
why striving to promote in every way trade and economic relations with South Korea. Moscow is not going to abandon her economic positions in North Korea, whose economy was developed with Soviet assistance. And till now, in many aspects, is oriented towards Russian technological and resource base and commodity markets. More than 70 industrial enterprises were built in North Korea during the Soviet period with Soviet Union assistance. I would like at the same time to bring your attention to the well-known but frequently omitted fact that Russia's turning to the East policy, including that to North Korea, was launched well before the Ukrainian events, as early as in November of 2000, six months after starting his first term in office, President Vladimir Putin outlined the major directions of the strategy in his article, Russia, New Eastern Perspectives. The current situation in relations between Russia and the West just accelerated the development and proves how far-sighted this the Russian leadership was when it had decided to balance relations with the West with the more active ties with the East. When the Ukrainian events started to unfold, Russia was already prepared and promoting more active her cooperation with major Asia-Pacific economies, China, Japan, Republic of Korea, countries of Southeast Asia. Initiating railway and gas pipeline project in Asia, establishing Ministry of Development of the Far East, it was done in May of 2012 holding APEC summit in Vladivostok, September 2012, and signing the agreement on debt settlement with North Korea, September 2012. All those endeavors were undertaken well before the Ukrainian events. For example, political decision to implement Hassan Rajin project was taken in 2001 during North Korean leader Kim jong ils visit to Russia and his meeting with President Vladimir Putin. From the beginning, the project was sought as a pilot one for the linking Trans-Korean Railways with Trans-Siberian Main Line. Besides being economically profitable for both North and South Korea, it was expected that their joint efforts to implement, to implement the project is likely to contribute to the confidence building, reconciliation, and large-scale economic exchanges between both parts of the, of the country. Russia believed that such cooperation, I quote, will not only to be economically advantageous, but will also increase trust on the Korean Peninsula. In spite of deterioration of inter-Korean relations under President Limin Bak administration, Hassan Rajin project was launched in 2008 a joint Russian-North Korean venture, Rason Contrans, was established in 2010 to implement the project. I skip technical details and uh, just say that uh, Hassan Rajin project is, first of all, a business project designed to bring economic benefits to all its participants. Otherwise, Russia can hardly expect South Korea and some other countries would consider their joining the project. The participation in this project will provide the South Korea, for example, with the chance to build trust with the North and with opportunity to work with Pyongyang within a new trilateral framework. Some experts hope that the Russian side can play an important role as a damper in kind to reconcile two Korean sides' possible conflicting views in running the project. It is also worth mentioning that the project can be viewed as a first practical step in realizing the Eurasian <laughs> initiative put forward by South Korean President Park geun hye as one of her foreign policy priorities. President Putin 
in particular remarked, I quote, if South and North Korea are becoming certain political difficulties, could agree to reconnect trans-Korean railways, if South Korean companies choose to join the development of rail transportation infrastructure, including port facilities in North Korea, this would be an important contribution to realization of the program proposed by President Park geun which is indeed very interesting a promising one. The above mentioned developments in economic relations between Russia and uh, North Korea and other economic plans of integration in Northeast Asia can be considered as a part of general economic integration and globalization process in Northeast Asia. Those processes provide us with new instruments for engaging North Korea. It is highly likely that, that more active involvement of North Korea in those processes may bring about positive changes in her international behavior. Lessons of German unification, downfall of socialism in East Europe and regime change scenarios imposed by United States and its allies on the Balkans, in Iraq and Libya alarmed North Korean leaders. Unless North Korean elite would be provided with clear guarantees of their personal safety, adequate social status, and certain well level of well-being after unification, it would stay united and remain very reluctant to open the country and abandon nuclear weapons. Economic cooperation will help to develop North Korean economy, to make the North Koreans more prepared to live and work in a modern society. In other words, it will help to lessen the existing gap between two parts of the country and cut unification costs. It will help to enlarge in North, Co in North Korea a growing strata of people interested in sustainable cooperative relations with the outside world. Only inviting in honest North Korea to participate in the realization of multilateral economic projects in Northeast Asia, including those proposed by Russia, it would be possible to convince Pyongyang that international community had taken on a road leading to North Korea gradual and peaceful integration in the existing international political and economic order instead of forcing on the country a regime change scenario. That's why I disagree with those advocating postponing practical implementation of multilateral economic projects in Northeast Asia with North Korean participation until the nuclear problem in Korea is resolved. Since 2014, one can see a drastic increase of various contacts between Russia and North Korea. Both countries have agreed to step up bilateral trade, bringing it in, 2000, in 2020, 2020 to $1 billion. Last month, Russian Minister for Development of the Far East, Alexander Galushka, traveled to Pyongyang for the seventh session of Intergovernment Commission on Economy, Trade, Science, and Technology Cooperation. Large-scale projects like modernization of railway and electricity transmission lines, networks in North Korea, oil and gas, and other natural resources exploration were under discussion. Sure, so far most of those projects are at the initial stage. However, it looks like that both sides are much more interested in their fulfillment than ever before. Speaking after coming back from Pyongyang to journalist, uh, Alexander Galushka said that canceled visit by Kim Jong-un to Moscow will not affect in any way implementation of the agreements reached at the meeting of the Intergovernmental Commission. Facing international sanctions and tense re political relations with China, North Korea is trying to di diversify her external economic ties. On the other hand, turning to the East has become one of the Russia's main foreign policy priorities. Promoting relations with North Korea is one of the important components of this strategy. 
Many experts in the West are underestimating the degree of Russia's influence and role of Moscow bilateral contacts with Pyongyang in recent developments in North Korea, foreign and domestic policy. For North Korea, both Russia and China too, reform experience is valuable, first of all, from the point of view of their political results and lessons. During trips to Russia, the North Korean high-ranking officials get a first-hand experience that market-oriented transformations and even political reforms not necessarily should result in a loss of power by the current ruling elite. These this elites in Russia and China and Vietnam too generally have retained their positions. There were no large-scale purges, etc. The fact may convince North Korea leaders that a market is not so terrible as it was used to be painted, that it is possible to realize economic transformation and not to lose at all political power and retain key institution of the previous model, such as dominant position of the ruling party. A few words specifically on a uh, 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 to elaborate on Russia's position on unification on, on Korea. Moscow's position concerning inter-Korean rapprochement and possible results is determined by Russian national interests. This interest certainly will benefit, first of all, from liquidation of a long-time conflict next to Russia for Eastern region and from founding, in the end, a unifying Korean state capable of maintaining relations of friendship, good neighborhood, and cooperation with Russia. Secondly, better relations between North and South Korea, as I said, along with providing Russia with more favorable conditions for development of trade and economic cooperation with both parts of Korea, would open new opportunities for economic development of the Russian Far East and for linking Russia economy to integration process in Asia Pacific. So, both on security and economic reasons, Russia is vitally interested in peace, reconciliation, and unification of Korea. This conclusion seems especially important in view of continuing attempts by some experts to convince public opinion that none of the neighboring countries, including Russia, is interested in Korea reunification. So what the problem? In my opinion, History of the Korean settlement for the past 25 years, including time and again encountered difficulties in solving the nuclear issue on the peninsula, makes us to conclude that without solution of a certain key fundamental problem directly related to the region's future security architecture, we will continue incessantly stumble of minor problems and will not be capable to tackle them. This fundamental key issue which any peace process in Northeast Asia should resolve is defining and acceptable for four big countries, Russia, China, United States, and Japan, a place for a future reunited Korea in the regional security system. Short of such vision, each and every participant of the negotiating process will remain very suspicious about other plans and intentions. It's equal to attempt of six teams of construction workers to build house without agreed project. Any team will have different vision, how many stories, how many windows, and where the entrance to this house will be. Many politicians and experts in United States of America, in Republic of Korea, and in Japan have already listed the reunited Korea as a member of this trilateral military and political alliance between United States, Japan, and Korea, to which Australia has been already linked by a number of agreements. However, such plans are unlikely to be welcomed in Moscow and Beijing. Both countries are likely to perceive such a triangle as a deterrence against Russia and China. 
such an alliance would be tantamount to emergence on Russia eastern borders, a body similar to NATO in Europe, under the umbrella of missile defense system, which is actively deployed by United States and their allies in the region. Calculations to the effect that future reunited Korea will be de facto a forward base of maritime powers, the United States and Japan, against continental China and Russia can hamper and is already hindering both the establishment of reliable and sustainable peace system in Northeast Asia, the solution of the nuclear problem, and the reunification of Korea. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Zevin, uh, for, um, for your remarks. Um, um, before we continue with the discussion, I want to introduce the other members of the panel that have joined us this morning. Um, to Dr. Zevin's uh, immediate left is Andrew Cutchins. Andrew, Andy is the uh, senior fellow and uh, uh, director of the Russia and Eurasia program here at CSIS. Uh, and then to Andy's left is uh, Gil Rosman, who is the Musgrave Professor of Sociology at Princeton University, Emeritus, as well as in, uh, the editor of the Asan, the Asan Review? The Asan Asan Forum. The Asan Forum, which is a uh, new and quite dynamic online uh, journal uh, with issues uh, related to East Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia, and Eurasia. Um, and so th they both agreed to join us this morning and offer uh, some comments as well as engaging in discussion uh, amongst us on the floor, uh, on the, on the uh, panel, but as well as with you on the floor. So um, perhaps maybe, uh, Gil, could we start with you? And you want to start off with some initial reactions and sure. get the conversation going? Well, um, I think uh, uh, Dr. Jebin has introduced a, a very important point of view for understanding what's happening on the Korean Peninsula. His comments in some ways echo what he wrote in the, in the newspaper Niza Vistumaya Gazeta, uh, two articles in April. I've been following things he's written for many years. Uh, and basically, I think, uh, as you saw the comments unfold, they start with proposals for uh, cross-border economic interaction that are of long standing and refer to the Hassan Rajin Rason uh, cross-border development, which South Korea has been interested in, but they go keep going and going. And essentially what I think they say is, while the United States policy is centered on preventing Byongjin, the uh, guns and, and butter goal of Kim Jong-un, Russia's policy, as expressed here, is to help Byongjin give the butter, the economic development to North Korea and then trust them to turn around and become a responsible state that may eventually denuclearize. So it's really the opposite approach. Uh, beyond that, as he pointed out towards the end of his remarks, this is an approach that says if South Korea wants progress and cooperation with dealing with North Korea, it's got to abandon the alliance with the United States that the alliances are the problem in the region and a regional security structure is the solution. And that now what the US is doing with Japan is pushing it into a, a new Cold War in Asia where we heard there's a NATO in Asia forming that's a threat to Russia and China and now something must be done about it. I think he goes further in his articles to suggest that without North Korea getting more assistance in arms, they are being left somewhat defenseless. And therefore, it's time for Russia to start, I get the implication, helping North Korea with, ar with armaments as well as with economics. 
And that kind of rebalancing of the peninsula is the way to create the environment for uh, prospects for reunification. Maybe I, he will disagree with some of what I'm reading in his remarks, but that, I think, is the overall approach here. Uh, and meanwhile, there is a sense that South Korea has lost the trust of Russia because President Park did not go to the Sochi Olympics, because she did not go to the 70th anniversary celebration the other day, uh, and that really South Korea is, with its interest in missile defense, is joining in with the, uh, the containment policy that is against Russia's national interest. Uh, and this goes along with a view of history that uh, is in, in being increasingly expressed in Russia, where the Korean War was a just uh, support for um, the regional structure that emerged after 1945, and that uh, the 70th anniversary is a time to recommit Russia to the Cold War balance that still hasn't been resolved, and we now need a, a new regional security framework that will get us beyond uh, the Cold War. And in the meantime, let's assume that the Korean Peninsula is still in the Cold War and that Russia has to do what it can to balance what the United States uh, and South Korea are doing to try to reestablish um, or to strengthen their dominance and to bring about what is regarded as a civilizational threat, a regime change, and a break, breakthrough that ends the agreements in, the, in Asia the way Ukraine policies of the West and the United States have broken down the post-war agreements in Europe. I'll, I'll stop there. Okay. Um, all right. A lot of food for thought there. Uh, Andy? Um, <clears throat> thanks, Victor. It's a real pleasure to be here. And uh, also thanks to the Global Peace Foundation, as the Russians uh, are fond of saying, Mir Tiesen, it's a small world. That uh, Mike Marshall, uh, his uh, wonderful daughter, Sung In, very smart and talented, uh, worked here with the, the Russian Eurasia program. Uh, for a couple of years, uh, and uh, in fact, she was just here in town and saw her a couple of days ago for a big launch of a set of programs, uh, activities that we've been doing on Central Asia. Um, I have a, just a couple of comments about <laughs> contemporary events. You know, this story about the, the supposed executed general hit me a little bit close to home because I was in Moscow several weeks ago at the, uh, uh, the, Mos the Ministry of Defense annual conference uh, where the North Korean General Hyun spoke. And uh, hearing the reports yesterday of his supposed execution, now there have been doubts cast on that. I saw it in today's newspapers. Yeah. <laughs> it, kind of, it kind of hit me a little close, close to home. Not that uh, you know, I'm great friends with the general or anything, but um, it's such a bizarre story. Um, but then also, it also kind of gets to the point of the, uh, the question of whether Kim Jong-un was going to come to Moscow for the um, uh, Victory Day celebrations. Uh, and my, I was traveling in, in Tokyo to Tokyo and to Beijing earlier in the fall, earlier in the spring, excuse me, in early, early April, and uh, my interlocutor, interlocutors in Japan and China were quite skeptical that, that he would do so, with the reasoning being that uh, for Kim Jong-un to make a first foreign trip to Moscow, and particularly and to be on a podium where he would be with Xi Jinping, uh, would be a little bit maybe provocative, uh, uh, you know, I think where he makes his first trip is important, but I defer to, to those on the, the panel here who are far more knowledgeable about these things than I am. But it does remind me of uh, Mr. Putin's uh, experience back when he first came to power in 2000 and his meeting with uh, Kim Jong-un's father. And subsequently, he, Mr. Putin then made his first major appearance on the international stage by going to the uh, 
G7 at that time meeting in Okinawa. And of course, his interlocutors there were very curious about his impressions of uh, Kim Jong-il. And it was there that he uh, uh, made public uh, the supposed offer that uh, the North Korean, le Korean leader had made of trading off, um, uh, giving up its uh, aspects of its ballistic missile program in return for opportunities for international space launch. Uh, several weeks later, though, Mr. Putin was very much embarrassed uh, when Kim Jong-il said that was basically a joke. I don't think that Mr. Putin found that joke very funny. <laughs> and I'm certain he did not, he did not forget it. Um, my, I was reminded again, I was thought of North Korea this spring also in the context of Mr. Putin's 11-day disappearance. And there are very few leaders that disappear with no explanation for 11 days. Um, I, but I could imagine this happening with Kim Jong-un, North Korean leader, perhaps. But I don't think that, I mean, it was, it was bizarre. Now, in the spring, when there was talk about the possibility of Kim Jong-un going to Moscow and the opening, uh, and what that represented, I was asked uh, many, on many occasions by the media, was this something that the Russians were doing to kind of poke it in the eye of the United States? And the answer is basically no. It's not so much tied to the United States. Although, of course, in the context of the um, aggravated conflict between, the, between Washington and Moscow for the past 15 months with the war in Ukraine, it's easy to jump to that conclusion. But in fact, I think there are very uh, important strategic reasons for why uh, Moscow and the DPRK have been reaching out to each other, and they were illustrated, uh, pointed out by uh, doc many of Dr. Jevin's remarks. Let me put it in kind of my frame. First of all, if we look at it at the, at the Korean-Russian relationship historically, think that four times in the first half of the 20th century, Russia fought wars against Japan, 1904-05, uh, 1937, 1938, and then again in 19, 1945. So it puts a little context, I think, maybe on how Korea and Russia uh, look at each other. Secondly, the next point I would make is, you know, when the Soviet Union, when Gorbachev normalized relations with uh, uh, Seoul in 1990, he, they basically sold Pyongyang down the river. And I think that that is clearly viewed uh, by the Russians today and for a while as a significant mistake, the way they cut off ties with the DPR, DPRK. Now, the, the reason why Gorbachev did it is because the Soviet Union was going bankrupt. He needed money. He was desperate. And uh, that was the basic motivation for it. I mean, to do it in a way there was the, the potential of a, a possible $3 billion credit at the time. Um, now, why, is it, why, is it a mis why was it a mistake? Well, I think it gets to, we talk about today, Russia's pivot to Asia. And you look at, well, you look at Russia's, the Soviet and Russia engagement in Asia, uh, even going back to the Cold War. Ever since the beginning of the, and I think it's very important for the Washington policy community to understand, particularly in today's environment where relations with Moscow are worse than they've ever been uh, since some point in the Cold War, I would say the earlier part of the Cold War. Um, and why are they so bad? Okay, they're basically bad because of a fundamental dispute over European security. And it's important to remember that, you know, Russia is a huge country with major interests all over its periphery. And when Moscow looks at Asia, it looks at it quite differently. And of course, the fundamental factor, the starting factor there is China. And so, you know, the experience in the early 1950s of the Sino-Soviet alliance, that was not a happy experience for either Moscow or, or Beijing. Uh, then you had the Sino-Soviet conflict and the border conflict in 1969. And from that point on, I think that Moscow looked at uh, U.S. 
military presence in Asia in a somewhat different light than it did in a European context. I mean, NATO and US military presence in Europe has always been viewed pretty much negatively. In Asia, it's different. And um, mostly it has to do with, uh, with China. To some extent, Japan, there was the, the theory about the Japanese-American Security Alliance puts the cork in the bottle, possibly on Japanese re, uh, remilitarization, potential return of a more nationalistic Japan that Russia contended with with difficulty in the first half of the 20th century, et cetera. So I think it's important to keep this, this kind of perspective in background when we look at uh, Moscow's relations with Seoul as well as Pyongyang uh, today. Um, now, the, the, cur the current pivot to, pivot to Asia. Well, okay, Moscow sees exactly what the rest of the world sees, that the balance of economic power in the world is shifting to Asia. This is a more dynamic area, and for the development of Russia's Eastern Siberian and Russian Far East regions and the resources there, it's gonna be primarily Asian investment which is going to make that, make that happen. And it's an important thing for Russia's development into the 21st century. Russia's well aware that China is gonna be the largest investor in this. But it's very important for Russia that they do not feel over leveraged by Chinese investment. So the way to do that is to attract other investors, other partners. And here's where Korea plays an important role, Japan, Japan plays an important role, other Asian countries, and also the United States in this context, in this context as well, as well possibly. Um, now, on the other, another, another important aspect of it, and uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Jebin's uh, descriptions of some of the, the, uh, the economic projects, uh, the gas pipeline, electricity grid, uh, railroad, connectivity, connectivity. I mean, there is a funda fundamentally important thing that's happening on the Eurasian continent today. And I mean Europe to Asia, Russia to India. And it's reconnecting, reconnecting. Sea trade, of course, is, is dominant. It will be dominant. But every country uh, is looking at some version of kind of a Silk Road strategy. President Park enunciated uh, a couple of, couple of years ago. Uh, Russia as well. How are they going to be able to take advantage of and to be part of these new transit corridors, trade and investment relationships that are developing and are having a fundamental impact on kind of changing the, the geoeconomic landscape of Eurasia? And this is where the reunification or a soft landing of the Korean conflict is important uh, for, for Russia. Because none of these projects can happen unless uh, there is some kind of rapprochement that takes place between uh, Seoul and, uh, and Pyongyang. And, <clears throat> and I think for, for, for South Korea, for North Korea, I mean, every country that is on China's periphery shares some degree of concern about the concern I just mentioned that Russia has, even a country as large as Russia, about being over leveraged by Chinese economic power and thus political influence. And so they want to have kind of a multi-vector foreign policy. And they want to have options and alternatives. That's the best way to advance their sovereignty. And I think this is a, the context I kind of, uh, that I see Russia's approach uh, to the Korean Peninsula and why Russia is unequivocally uh, supportive, ultimately, of the reunification of the Korean, the Korean Peninsula. I'll stop. Great, Andy, thanks. Uh, both Gil and Andy, thanks so much. So, um, um, so I think also there are few people in Washington who could claim to have been at a conference with General Hyun, <laughs> the North Korean general who was um, reported in the news to have been executed yesterday. Um, so kudos to you, Andy. <laughs> um, so I think um, listening to this, there's sort of three areas, and I'm gonna give Dr. Devin a, a chance to respond. There's sort of three areas I think that we've covered. The first is uh, the so-called Russian pivot to Asia, the Russian pivot to the Korean Peninsula. You know, what are the drivers of that? And there I also wanna add a specific question which was, um, uh, the, uh, which you um, 
addressed in your paper, you didn't go into the details in your talk, but this, uh, this in particular, this coal project, this coal transport project in Najin between the Russians, the uh, North Koreans, and the South Koreans. Um, and the specific question there, I, I think that, you know, that is sort of a, uh, a tangible example of the so-called pivot to the peninsula. And um, I guess the question there for you specifically is, um, uh, you know, they did a pilot run of a few hundred thousand tons of coal. And I think you mentioned in the paper uh, um, a certain capacity that the Najin port needs to be able to reach in order for this to be cost profitable for, for um, as an investment. And I guess the question to you is, you know, with this as an example and more broadly in terms of Russia uh, interest in infrastructure and connecting the peninsula, you know, how much of a capacity problem is there when it comes to the North Korean piece? Like, I don't think there's necessarily a capacity problem on the Russian side. There's certainly not on the South Korean side. You know, how much of it is just a political issue with regard to North Korea and how much of it is a, you know, sort of nuts and bolts capacity problem um, to be able to move beyond, you know, some subsidized projects to something that can actually run, run on its own. Um, the second set of questions has to do obviously with North Korea and Andy really raised them uh, with regard to all these, you know, the, the cancellation, the last minute cancellation of the visit by Kim Jong-un uh, to Moscow. I think um, it, it at least sounded to me based on what I read in the press that the Russians were quite forthcoming in announcing that the North Korean leader would be coming. So they must have felt pretty confident about that. His cancellation of that, this reported execution by some means, we're not exactly sure, of, the, of General Hyun. Um, you know, you as someone who's lived in the, in the country and has studied the country, you know, what do you think's going on here? Sort of what's, 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 what's happening? And then the, the last is the broader conceptual uh, arguments that were uh, in, your, in your presentation as well as in Gil's remarks of this whole question of how the US, from a Russian perspective, how the US alliance system fits into a broader discussion of Korean unification. Gil put out that um, um, the proposition that uh, some of your arguments here and in, in your past writings are basically positing that the, uh, the US alliance system is actually an obstacle to, um, uh, to unification and to um, increased, uh, reduced insecurity, increased economic reform in, in North Korea. And I, I was hoping that maybe you could address uh, these, three, these three questions. Uh, and, then, and then we can open it up to the, to the audience. So Dr. Zedner. Thank you. thank you for the question, and thank you again for the Global Peace Foundation uh, for organizing and inviting me, along with the uh, Center for Strategic International Studies. I start f from the last question, since Dr. Rosman also raised it, concerning the United States uh, South Korean lines. Uh, uh, I never said that uh, Russia demands abrogation or cancellation of this alliance. Of course, this, uh, the situation should be resolved in complex. There is a, a China, North Korean military treaty, and the uh, United States, South Korean military treaty. My idea is uh, that for China and Russia, United Korea with American troops and missile defense on its territory, absolutely unacceptable from strategic, political, other points of view, especially for China, considering American pivot to Asia and American attempts to arrange kind of a uh, senator cordon around China borders to orient defense and uh, foreign policy of neighboring middle and small states around China towards Washington and achieve some kind of a military and political isolation China in Asia, because economically it's not possible as I isolate China. For China, the North Korea, at the current stage, even more important than Taiwan. Taiwan is Chinese historically and so on and so forth, but uh, for China, North Korea, strategically, because most of 
Chinese military industrial complex in Manchuria, to lose North Korea uh, is, uh, will be a huge uh, damage to China authority and position in Asia. Who among those small and middle countries around Chinese borders will ever rely on China as a defender, as an ally, if China will cede without uh, any fighting such traditional area, which was for hundreds of years in China's sphere of influence, like Korean Peninsula. Uh, just one example. In 2009, after North Korean uh, second nuclear test, China supported resolution of the United Nations Security Council condemning North Korea. But several months later, Chinese uh, Premier Wen Jiabao traveled to Pyongyang and lay flowers to Mao Zedong's son grave, Mao Anin, who died during the Korean War. Those who read Oriental politics as a symbolic politics, it was a clear signal to United States, to South Korea, to everybody in the world. The China lost one million lives in Korean War, not just to let North Korea go, to, 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 to be the future Platzdam or base for threatening China. It is absolutely clear, in spite of all discussion in China, among China experts and uh, academic society, that present leadership of China and maybe next leadership will consider the situation of the Korean Peninsula from that point of view. And one important point for me is uh, that uh, too many experts believe somehow that United Korea will develop according to the liberal democracy rules and market economy rules. Market economy, maybe, but experience of China, Vietnam, testifies that market reforms are possible uh, under the leadership of Communist Party, like it happened in China and Vietnam. So the even introduction of market economy in North Korea uh, not necessarily will lead to the change of the key political institutions and ruling elite. That opens quite uh, different perspectives for development of events on the peninsula. Let's, I move to the other points. Uh, the first question was about the Russian pivot to Asia. And uh, Russia, uh, as I said, started it uh, in early last decade. And uh, we developed relations with China very actively. Why North Korea should be an exclusion? We are working with Japan, we are working with Vietnam, and uh, of course we, uh, uh, Pivot to Asia was also, uh, the major idea was to balance uh, uh, relations with uh, uh, East, with Europe, with, uh, with relations with uh, Asia, because Asia was uh, becoming a very dynamically developed economic region, and uh, we, not, we are not going to uh, just uh, make ex exclude any country in our efforts in this area. China, Mongolia, uh, South, North Korea, uh, it was, it, everything was uh, in due order according to necessary political, economic, and other conditions when they are ripen we are move in that particular direction, and the same with North Korea. Uh, after President Putin came to power again in, 2000, in 2012, the decision to settle the debt problem was taken very quickly, and uh, the uh, signing of the agreement was uh, in a few months after, his, uh, uh, after he came to office. Concerning the Mm. Rajin uh, Hassan project, uh, yes, a Russian feasibility, feasibility study says that uh, for the project to become uh, profitable, it's necessary that the Rajin port handled four, five million tons annually. For this year, the task is already 1.5 billion 
it is possible to reach it. Uh, and I don't see any political obstacles. 1.5 million. 1.5 for this year. Million. million yeah, tons. million tons. Yes, million tons. And yeah. uh, uh, for the, to be profitable. <laughs> four to five. Right. Four, five per year. Yeah. And uh, I don't see any political obstacles for that. Uh, we need uh, just to, of course, this is a new uh, project and it should compete with other ports in the, uh, this area. It's necessary to uh, uh, win trust from uh, uh, international uh, companies who deal with logistics and cargo shipping in this area that they will start more actively this uh, uh, use of this port. But is, uh, as I said, is purely economic problem, not political problem. The next one uh, concerning the uh, Kim Jong-un uh, council visit to uh, Moscow. Uh, the same day when uh, uh, there was announcement about the council visit, uh, I published my uh, interview to Interfax news agency in Russia and uh, uh, my first reason was uh, that uh, Mr. Kim uh, was reluctant maybe to promise Mr. Putin that he will not test anymore. Mm -hmm. Anybody who can read this interview can find these words. And that was the key problem. And as you know, two days later, Mr. Kim visited uh, uh, Satellite Command Center and Several days more later, they tested. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that uh, that was maybe the major reason because Kim, Mr. Kim would feel uh, himself very uncomfortable uh, when uh, in talks with Mr. Putin, maybe he, th this problem was certainly on the agenda. And to promise that, especially in view of forthcoming anniversaries in North Korea, 70th anniversary of liberation in August 15, and 70th anniversary of the ruling party, which comes on October 10. And uh, my personal view that it is quite possible that North Korea will try to celebrate the 70th anniversary of the working, Workers' Party by uh, launching another satellite. In October. Yeah, in October. In October. Why not? I, I don't think that they uh, spent a lot of money to construct this center, uh, command center for launching uh, satellite and uh, just to waste uh, money. They, they are preparing some, something and uh, uh, quite possible that it event will take place in, uh, uh, in October this year. But it's my personal opinion. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. I don't necessarily disagree with you on that point. Um, yeah, I kind of worry about October as well. Okay, um, I'd like to now give a chance to folks in, on the floor to be able to ask some questions. Yes, sir. W please wait for the mic. Yeah. Thank you very much for great conversations. I'm Takahiro Motei, a visiting fellow of Japan chair. Uh, what I'd like to ask you there is the reason of cancellation of Mr. Kim's visit to Moscow. But when it comes to the reason, there are a few views and I think more persuasive one is that because so Kim Jong found that there was a big gap between his request and hospitality Russia can provide. I mean, for example, when they took a picture, Kim Jong Un insisted to have to stand by Mr. Putin next to Mr. Putin or something like that. But uh, I mean, Russian government doesn't cannot accept this kind of request. So do you agree with this kind of view from the Russian side? Is there this kind of thing? Mm. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, no, there are some people who uh, argue that uh, Mr. Kim uh, failed to come because he thought that he will be among many others and not so visible. F but Mr. as uh, far as I know, Mr. Kim invited uh, in September to China. The same problem. Maybe among much more others <laughs> he will be. And uh, I strongly doubt that Chinese leaders can pay 
uh, much more attention to him in Beijing than he uh, was expected to get in Moscow. So uh, these arguments uh, doesn't work, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. uh, David. Hi, Dave Caprera with both GPF and Brookings. Uh, it seems after 70 years uh, we should be trying uh, some new dynamics. I really commend you, Dr. Jebin, for your, your talk today. I think unlocked a lot of ideas of serendipities. And I wonder if you or any panelists might concur that there's positives in the reset that both Obama and Bush have tried with Russia. You know, uh, the eastern, uh, western flank has been alluded to, but some possible positives of Russia's engagement in terms of the U.S. Uh, dynamic with Russia uh, as we mutually try to find ways to enhance what President Park and A has put forward as, as a top priority of unification. So I, I would like to think that there's some positives in the Eastern Front could occur from the kinds of investments and other, other scenarios. And I, I'd also just note that we have other allies. These forums have been so wonderfully organized with Dr. Cha. Uh, looked at other angles of, of potential recasting of, of good relations or peace dividend in, in the so-called bonanza of Park and A. And I see our leading Mongolist here, Dr. Alicia Kepi, uh, another forum dealt with Mongolia, which has excellent ties, right, with both Russia, China, and the U.S. Uh, we have Ye Ching Li here next month. They'll be with UNSCAP, a joint forum on young leaders across Northeast Asia, and, and a service alliance also examining perhaps some some other track two or 1.5 possibilities. But I, I'm just wondering, are, are there any others that see positives uh, in terms of the U.S. Uh, relations or other relations uh, in, in that neighborhood uh, through this type of Russian uh, strategy? Thanks, David. Thank you. Um, I, I just say in response, I mean, I think the, uh, I mean, I think this coal project is very interesting um, because uh, it, it's still at the pilot stages, but but it's you know clearly something the Russians have been focused on, and the South Korean government has been participating very quietly. They've been participating, um, and you know, in that sense, I think you know they're asked. I think in many ways Russia has very unique. If you look at the surrounding powers around the Korean Peninsula, Russia has very unique economic interest on the peninsula in the sense that. Of all the powers surrounding the Korean Peninsula, arguably, Russia is the one whose economic interests are most about connecting the peninsula, right? Because of the infrastructure, and more than you know, China has interest in the in, in the Korean Peninsula, in the north, but it's really mining in the north and then commerce with the south. Um, uh, you know, Japan um, eventually will have investment interests in the peninsula, but Russia is the only one that actually has interests that seek to connect the peninsula. Um, now, you know, the 850 pound gorilla in the room, of course, is other countries are not really gonna bind on to that or support that as long as the nuclear issue remains in the state that it's in. But I think it's interesting that the South Korean government has been quietly participating in these projects, you know, with the hope that it might spur, uh, uh, you know, um, some sort of uh, opening or reform in the North. Um, it's, um, I think it's it's a long shot, but I still think it's interesting. Victor, yes. I'd like to respond there too. Yeah, Gil. Uh, I think that for 20 years or so, there have been arguments that Northeast Asia is the easiest environment for the United States and Russia to find common national interest, and that the transformation of North Korea could be a really important means to accomplish this. The first problem, I think, is that Russia has not created a, an attractive investment environment despite the heavy um, use of funds in, in, in Vladivostok at the time of the APEC summit a few years ago. They really haven't done that for either the United States or Japan or even South Korea. So all of them have said, we really want to be part of some transformation. So, but Russia is now saying, I think, we're going to rely very heavily on China, and there's this um, the important tra this summit between P Xi and Putin uh, the other day is, is a very significant development. I think it's as significant as the Abe 
uh, Obama summit, and people haven't paid enough attention to what it means. But it really is a more of a de deference to, to China. Uh, and, uh, and I think the implications, they both want to restart the six-party talks without conditions in a way that's consistent with this line of analysis that we've just heard. And so I, I don't see how we can be optimistic about the Russian great interest in reunification and the Russian desire for a massive uh, macro project development going through the Korean Peninsula unless Russia creates the conditions for that. And those conditions just haven't been created. Rather, I think what Russia is now saying more and more is it wants to strengthen North Korea and put pressure on the others. And if they don't follow what Russia is seeking, then Russia will do things with North Korea that will make it unlikely that the others will be willing to cooperate. So I think that the door has been open. The reset, I think, had a lot of promise for this, but that really what Russia has chosen is North Korea over South Korea and the, as its means of restarting the reunification process. I'll, I'll, let me I'll, add I'll, I'll, I'll give you couple. some, let, let, me get, let, let me get Andy to say something and then we'll go to, we'll go to you. You can um, collect all the comments. Thanks, it's a great question, David. Um, you know, I uh, definitely believe for example, that Russo-Japanese rapprochement is in U.S. national interest. And that what I was alluding to or trying to state in my remarks at the outset is that our fundamental difference in U.S. with Russia is in the European theater and in Russia's near, near, near abroad. Now, I wouldn't say that Northeast Asia is the easiest place for the United States and Russia to find common interests, but there are common interests there. But you can look at a lot of other theaters where there are, where there are common interests. The most obvious one and where there was the greatest, uh, most robust security cooperation in the 25 years since the Cold War ended was in Afghanistan in the fall of 2001 and the work to take out the, uh, the Northern Alliance. One could point to uh, other radical jihadist terrorist groups, ISIL, um, and others where we share a com common interest. Um, on the Asia question, um, again, I think that uh, these, as, as Victor was saying, the, the coal project and these other connectivity projects, you know, I, if they are commercially feasible, why not? Yes, they're commercially. And I think, and I think, I think we need to, you know, try to walk and chew gum at the same time. Uh, I'm not saying obviously to set aside the nuclear dispute, but that's the nuclear dispute is not is not the whole it's not the whole game. There are a lot of other aspects to the strategic environment in which this is taking place and the degree to which there is, uh, you know, greater connectivity, a more robust economic relationship between North and South Korea seems to me to make sense to kind of help to facilitate a softer landing uh, if and when uh, we ever get to that point. Uh, just a couple of points. First of all, uh, nuclear issue. Uh, the recent uh, experience, uh, experience of the last 25 years, starting from the uh, agreed framework, uh, proved that it, it is not possible to resolve nuclear issue without addressing North Korean security concerns. Any economic inducements wouldn't work. Agreed framework, uh, Lib Day deal, uh, Lehman Buck, 3000, openness, liberalization, all failed. Because for North Korea, security, for this system, security is top priority. And unless security concerns will not be addressed, there will be no progress in the re resolving of the nuclear issue at one point. 
and uh, we should uh, think about it. And second point uh, concerning the uh, uh, what uh, Dr. Rosman said about the North Korea, uh, Northeast Asia, and North Korea in particular as a very promising, was very promising area for Russian United States cooperation, uh, transformation of North Korea. But what will be the result of transformation? If the result of transformation will be uh, swallowing by, North, by South Korea, North Korea, and Korea unification after, on South Korean conditions, with American troops and missile defense moved to Russian and Chinese border, I hardly expect that China and Russia will be ready to cooperate to bring American soldiers right on Chinese and Russian borders, like it happened already in Europe. Gorbachev take it face value, value promises by the West that NATO will not be expanded to the East. I sure that Chinese know that well, and they will, would not buy the second horse the, sec, the same host the, uh, the second time, as Americans say concerning dealing with North Korea. And they will not promise your, uh, uh, they, they will not believe your promises that American troops will not move north to the 80, 38 parallel, or they will move only to uh, withdraw uh, uh, American nu uh, uh, North Korean nuclear weapon and so on and so forth. It will not work. Okay. Andy, one or two. Yeah, I, I, thanks, Victor. I forgot I wanted to mention one other thing. I, I totally agree with Gil that the biggest weakness of the Russian pivot to Asia uh, is the failure to uh, address the environment, investment environment challenges. But on the Sino Russian relationship, I think it's important to keep a certain degree of skepticism about this. Uh, for example, on these so-called gas deals uh, that go back to May of last year and the second one in the fall of fall of this year, I think there's a significant uh, unhappiness on the Chinese part about what is viewed as delays and failure of Russia to actually deliver on the, on the gas deal. Uh, President Xi has met Mr. Putin, i do not not sure, around 10 or so times, and still there is, an, there is an agreement on paper. There are tremendous challenges and problems involved in the project itself. And the fact that the Russians came back in the, in the fall with the desire for uh, the so-called Western route of an additional 30 BCM of gas, this is not really what the Chinese want. Uh, it's not it's not the right delivery point for the for the for the gas, and um, I just it's important to keep a, a very realistic eye. Certainly, in the context uh, of the uh, alienation uh, or the deterioration of Moscow's relations with the West in the last 15 months, it's natural that Moscow is going to want to make much more of this uh, relationship with uh, with China but there are still uh, significant uh, problems in it and a long history of, uh, of distrust and a, and a long history of, of failures, I think, from the Chinese perspective, the Russians to deliver on what they promise uh, for oil and gas deals regarding China. Well, we should divide political vision and commercial disputes. There are very strong commercial disputes between such allies as the United States and right. Japan concerning agriculture, automobiles. The same between the United States and uh, South Korea, the same. Uh, rice, uh, meat, uh, American meat, American automobiles. So commercial disputes, it's one side of the matter, but political vision and security is the interest, it's different. And I think that if you look at the recent history of Russian-Chinese summit meetings, joint statements, and practical dealings in political and security sphere, we see almost total similarity, unity, and agreement. Of course, like all commercial partners, 
there can be, it should be differences. But I think that it can be resolved. And world history and world economic history knows examples of such resolution. For example, there is a always dispute about which line, east coast line in Korea or west coast line um, uh, of railway will be more profitable or uh, should be built first of all. A line which goes from Seoul, Quezon, Pyongyang, Sinaiju, Dandun, or uh, from, um, let's say, Koson and uh, Wonsan, Chongjin, and Hassan. I think that both lines are, will be built in the final end. And experience of Europe, European integration started from the European um, Union of coal and steel, where there was quotas for each country. The same with China and Russia. East line will get their quota, and West line, which goes to China, will get their quota. Commercial disputes, as practice and history shows, can be resolved. Major point is a common strategic vision of the security and political situation in the region. And from this point, at the present, city, at the present uh, point, uh, the positions of Russia and China, as was once again testified by recent visit by Xi Jinping to Moscow, is almost identical. I mean, the, the uh, interesting thing about um, what you propose with regard to Russia and the Korean Peninsula, the separation of politics and economics, really takes a page out of what the South Koreans did with the Soviet Union in 1990, which was really to separate politics and economics. They had something called Nord Politik or Northern Policy, uh, where they emphasized the common economic interests uh, with the Soviet Union and with a lot of Eastern Bloc countries. So as you know well, from 1988 onwards, the South Koreans normalized relations with Hungary, Poland, many other countries leading to the Soviet Union in 1990. At that time, it was easy to separate politics and economics because the larger superstructure was changing, right? The relationship between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, and South Korea didn't pose a direct military threat to the Soviets in any way. But the, with North yeah. South also separated during Kim Tae Jong and yeah. No Mo Hyun yeah. time. Yeah. It was quite successful, it seems yeah. to me. Yeah. And I believe that if uh, South will continue the same path, now, no, no South relations at the moment are much more better than they are now. Yeah, yeah. And of course, the, the one challenge that remains is that uh, the nuclear problem is not getting, it's getting, ex it seems to be getting exponentially worse, um, which, uh, which was something that didn't exist in the early 1990s. Unfortunately, we've, uh, I know this, I'm sure that this conversation has sparked lots of questions and comments from the audience, but unfortunately, we're out of time. We're that, we're out of time. Dr. Zebin's paper, I think, is available outside, and we'll have it online as well. Um, we want to thank you very much for taking the time to come out here and be with us. And I want to thank um, my panelists also, uh, Gil Rosman and Andy Cutchins, for joining us, and you as well. Thank you all, and uh, have a good day. Bye.